In this week's video, I explain to you why you should not use spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee or morbus albeg as a diagnosis. What? The spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, also known as SONC or morbus albeg, is a diagnosis that everybody reads about in medical school and even I did uh, in medical school learn about this entity. And if you're watching this video, chances are you probably grew up with this diagnosis as well. And if you're a patient, you maybe have this diagnosis and uh, maybe one of the orthopedic doctors or your uh, GP or any other doctor uh, said that you have a song of the knee, for example. Now, in this video, I would like to show you the original publication. We go through some medical history and actually, if you watch till the end, you will understand why the diagnosis of song or morbus albeck should not be used anymore. So spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee is frequently used for findings like in this case here we have the severe bone merodema in the lateral femoral condyle although more often the medial side is affected. However, here we have a 40 year old patient, female, and it's the lateral femoral condyle. Um, they have a sudden onset of pain without trauma and then you do an MR and you see this large area of bone merodema. Sometimes you see these uh, hypointense lines here in this fluid sensitive sequence and they are consistent with subchondral insufficiency fractures and that's basically already the problem here. So I'm pretty sure some of you would use the term morbus albeck or spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee for this exact case. Others would probably prefer the term subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee. And now let's go through the literature and see uh, what is what. If you are one of 39 amazing people that support my channel every month with a tiny donation, some a little bigger, then you already know about this topic because I made an exclusive video for my patrons last year. However, I feel the need uh, to do another video because I think the topic is still not in all of the minds of the medical professionals and we should really go with the time and not stick with old, old terms uh, in that sense. Well, at the same time, I would also like to thank my five newest patrons uh, that joined me last week, and that is Sean, Dietmar, Joshua, Rajesh, and Siam Sundar. So I had to read the list, I'm sorry about that. Uh, thanks, guys, thanks for your support, and also thanks to all the other uh, supporters for their continuing support. So let's go back to the year 1968. This is the original publication by Albeck in the Arthritis and Rheumatism Journal back then, so way before we had MRI. And I will go through a few points here in this paper without giving an interpretation and then at, by the end of the video we come back and have a look what that actually uh, should mean etc. So this is the abstract just to make sure we all understand they had 39 patients, 40 knees, all patients over the age of 60s and most of them had, had spontaneous onset of severe knee pain and they were initially most of them normal on radiographs and then some developed osteoarthritis and some became asymptomatic and on the scintigraphy of symptomatic knees they had exceedingly high values of uh, uptake and biopsy showed evidence of bone repair uh, or repair of bone tissue rather and only two of these patients had a history of corticosteroid treatment and they had no other conditions that were associated with this osteonecrosis. <laughs> Then, then here something um, that is important to understand. In half of the knees on the radiographs they saw newly formed periosteal bone appeared on the medial aspect of the femur proximal to the medial condyle six to eight months following the onset of symptoms so keep that in mind. And then here under uh, they give an explanation what the scintigraphy actually means or the uptake of strontium back then. Uh, under certain conditions the strontium 85 scintimetry or scintigraphy values reflect the rate of bone formation. Abnormally high scintimetry values may thus constitute evidence for abnormally high rates of bone formation. So they even give here an explanation and then they uh, go on and say that all symptomatic knees showed extremely high values over the medial femoral condyle, which is the medial side that is more often affected in this disease. So increased values, increased uptake, we keep that in mind. Then we go on, they do a core biopsy in the seven knees, uh, perpendicular to the surface there. Um, in one 
patient, the biopsy site did not bleed, so that's a hint that probably the bone was dead, but all the rest of them, so the other six, they bled readily or heavily or whatever. And they also saw that in six knees, so out of the seven that they did surgery on, the medial meniscus was torn. So that's also a fact that we should keep in mind. And all menisci were torn in a radial orientation. So they had radial meniscal tears. We keep that in mind, we go on then. Yeah, they, they then saw under the microscope that at least few of these fragments were apparently necrotic. Um, Trabecular were trapped in fibrous tissue. Let's see what the pathologist saw else. So we had the area between the fibrous tissue and the normal cancerous bone was characterized by active bone formation. So we keep that in mind. Ranking after the vivid proliferation of fibrous tissue. Okay. The osteoblastic activity was the most prominent feature. So we keep that in mind. Consistent, consequently, in this transitional zone, slender newly formed trabecula were found lined by active osteoblasts. So we keep that in mind. So then really go on. They give a little discussion there. Some differential diagnosis. So let's see what they had. Uh, they had osteochondritis dissecans as differential, younger population, doesn't fit. Then we have the osteoarthritis, which is different also on radiographs and other clinical features. What else do they have? A fracture. So let's see what they said to fracture. So, very nice explanation. Fracture can be excluded as the cause of this condition discussed here because of the history. Well, they had sudden onset, they just didn't have a trauma, symptomatology and radiographic appearance. Yeah, not right. Then, infection as a differential, neuropathy, okay, tumor, well, and osteonecrosis. And they already knew back then that the osteonecrosis um, in patients with risk factors such as sickle cell, anemia, Gerson's disease, gaucher, etc., they manifest different. So the location is further from the subchondral bone and there is massive involvement of the lower femur with this geographic large uh, landscape uh, necrotic areas, as we all know. And this is how they came to the spontaneous osteonecrosis diagnosis, primarily on exclusion of other possible entities discussed above and only secondarily on radiographic, centimetric and anatomic observations. Now, before we move on, let me just give you here my approach. If I see something like this, whether we have this subchondral fracture here or not, it's a subchondral insufficiency fracture and not a necrosis. So we know the, the large necrotic bone stuff here, but this one here is a subchondral insufficiency fracture, more often medially than laterally, but nevertheless. A few months later in the same patient, you can see that this fracture completely healed. We don't have any residue here at this location. Everything is back to normal. If that would have been a necrosis, then I would expect that bone not healing, not good. Now this is another patient and we see the exact same finding this time on the medial side. We have this large area of bone marrow edema and if you look closely you can appreciate the subchondral fracture right here. Sometimes it's really hard to see and only very adjacent to the subchondral plate you will see this irregularity which is then a fracture and also make sure not uh, to look only on these fat saturated image but also on your PD fat sets like in this case, or if you have a T1 weighted sequence where you can see these fracture lines, sometimes a little better. This was the initial presentation and this one here was three months later and you can see right away what happened. Basically, this subchondral insufficiency fracture healed and we only have a small residue here where the fracture actually was. So this is the exact same basically image. So we have the fracture here and at this location we still have some signal changes. That's all right. But what then actually happened was probably because he was uh, not weight bearing and maybe he started weight bearing again, but then he had a fracture on the other side. This time we see the large bone marrow edema. And if you look and scroll through, you don't necessarily see a fracture here uh, right away. But if you then go to the other sequences here, PD without fat saturation, then you can start to see here these changes here. And we can have a look at them here uh, side by side. 
uh, this was the initial presentation this was three months later and if we zoom in onto the lateral femoral condyle where we didn't see the fracture on the on the fluid sensitive weighted sequences you can see here previously it was completely normal but now you see this change here which was not present there it's more or less horizontal, it's hypointense and signal intensity. So these are fractured trabecula. So this is the subchondral insufficiency fracture causing this large bone marrow edema in this case. So I quickly show you a few other studies uh, showing that this is not just my personal opinion, but it's something that in the scientific literature is coming more and more. So 2019 in skeletal radiology, it's already in the title, subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee. And it's really a nice introduction. And you can see here, subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee. They use a new abbreviation as opposed to SONC. They have S-I-F-K typically presents as a subchondral plate fracture surrounded by perifocal flame-like marrow edema, which can extend along and beyond the adjacent epiphysis. It results when a weakened subchondral bone plate is exposed to abnormal forces owing to absent overlying cartilage or inadequate meniscal protective property. Since its description by Albeck, so that's the paper that we just had a look at, this entity has been reported to involve the weight-bearing articular aspect of the medial femoral condyle in elderly women frequently presenting with severe automatic pain of sudden onset. Little to no osteonecrosis has been identified on histological studies, proving incorrect Albeck's original views that the lesion was due to osteonecrosis by excluding other possible etiologies such as arthritis, etc. And for this reason, the original term spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee is now considered a misnomer. The entity has recently been categorized along the spectrum of subchondral insufficiency fractures of the knee. So, very nice article. Here in the orthopedic literature 2020, um, they still have the spontaneous osteonecrosis in the title, probably because uh, the search algorithms are, or people are still looking for the SONC diagnosis, obviously. And then they uh, go on here, just having a look at the abstract. Um, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee has recently been termed subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee, SIFAK, to appropriately recognize the etiology of mechanical overloading of the subchondral bone. So it's interesting, in this study they had like two, over 200 patients and three out of four had meniscal root or radial tears. So this is very important. So if you have a patient with a subchondral insufficiency fracture, make sure you don't miss this meniscal tear. Very important finding, I think. And then they go on to other stuff, which is more for the orthopedic surgeons. So conclusions, subchondral insufficiency fractures predominantly involve the medial compartment of the knee, commonly present with medial meniscal root or radial tears. That's very important and still approximately one-third progresses to total knee arthroplasty a few years later so it's a relevant diagnosis then here in, um, in another orthopedic paper uh, with laprade very famous uh, guy so they had a systematic review of suspected etiology for the spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee so that you can see they use still this term in the title but then say that it's basically a misinterpretation and should be replaced by this name but they still use it in the title i'm not really sure why but um yeah anyways they go on they also saw that a lot of these patients or in in this review article or systematic review that a lot of these patients actually had uh, meniscal root tears so very important finding so they also <laughs> conclude that Song spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee is a misrepresentation of the etiology and pathogenesis of the condition and should be replaced with subchondral insufficiency fractures of the knee. So I think uh, it's now quite obvious that we should not use the term spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee anymore and also not Morbus Albeck but rather a subchondral insufficiency fracture of the knee. So that would be the correct diagnosis. And if we go back to the original publication and we go to all the stuff that I have shown you before. They did basically all the right things. So they saw periosteal bone appearing. So it's not that bone. So there was new bone formation on radiographs and later on also on histopathology. They even say that the scintimetry or scintigraphy with a high uptake shows abnormally high rates of bone formation. So we have bone formation and not that bone. 
Um, so I'm not a nuclear physician, but typically with bone necrosis in scintigraphy, you have this photopenic defects. That that is at least my understanding. So if they even say that increased uptake basically means higher rates of bone formation, I'm not sure how they concluded in the end that to be a osteonecrosis. So all symptomatic knees, high uptake in the medial femoral condyle. So they did the biopsy um, only in one patient. There was no bleeding, all the other patients bled at the side of the puncture. That's already a hint that it's vital bone. Um, this puncture bleeding test basically is also used in the wrist, in the scaphoid, to assess the vitality of the proximal fragment in, in scaphoid non-unions um, or pseudotrosis. So, not sure. They, they wrote it all down. Um, they even saw that the menisci were torn in a lot of these knees but did not come up with a potential etiology there. And this was just recently published in, in, in your publication, so, but it was already in the initial publication. Um, yeah, so then they go on to the to bone. Only few fragments were apparently necrotic. And the area between active bone formation, so here newly formed trabecular were found with active osteoblasts. So they had it all there but still somehow they came up with the wrong conclusion. Basically, I think I wanted to give you an argument or an argumentation why we should abstain from the term spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee because the etiology is basically wrong and we now know that it's a subchondral insufficiency fracture, even if we don't always see the fracture line itself. If you still use the term song or Morbus Albeck, basically you just mean the same thing. It's not a different etiology. So there's nothing separate from a subchronal insufficiency fracture. You just use another word which is not really appropriate for the same thing. And I think, uh, yeah, that should be about it. If you think this was helpful, make sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and also hit the like button. And I would love to see you next week.